long before the Monday Night Wars and even before Monday Night Raw itself and certainly before AEW Dynamite, weekend wrestling was where it was at. And out of all the places to catch televised weekend wrestling, many fans will tell you that some of the very best took place for World Championship Wrestling. But how did this program begin and whatever happened to it? Well, that's what we're here to talk about because this is the history of WCW Saturday Night. I want to give a big warm thank you to Ra, The Reflex, JPS, and The Reflection of Perfection. Thank all of you so much and the rest of the Patreon supporters as your help really does make a difference. So thank you. Now, this video is covering the history of WCW Saturday Night. But in order to put things in proper context, we're going to have to go back a little bit before that. Now, this does mean covering some previously established territory, but a little bit of a refresher never hurt anybody. And with that being said, let's start at the beginning. On Christmas Day 1971, which was a Saturday, Georgia Championship Wrestling would air a Christmas special on an independent UHF station in Atlanta called WTCG. However, based off of the success of the show, GCW would make this a regular thing, officially leaving their old home of WQXITV. Then in 1976, WTCG would begin retransmitting via satellite, thus becoming something of a super station, if you will, as it was available to cable systems all all across the country, resulting in Georgia Championship Wrestling being aired nationally. Then in 1979, the channel would be redubbed as WTBS. Georgia Championship Wrestling, the television series, was hosted by the legendary Gordon Soley and was taped out of WTBS Studios, which was located at 1050 Techwood Drive in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was filmed before a live studio audience. Following this in 1982, and company bigwig Jim Barnett would change the name of the show from Georgia Championship Wrestling to World Championship Wrestling, which was a name that he previously used for another promotion in Australia. This was the result of station owner Ted Turner wanting the show to have a less localized feel, and this also coincided with the fact that GCW had already been running shows in neutral territories like Ohio and Michigan. Now the new World Championship Wrestling show would continue taping in TBS Studios until March of 1989, when it was moved to West Peachtree Street and the Center Stage Concert Complex, and this initial taping would see a re-team of the old Mid-South commentary team with Jim Ross and Michael Hayes on the announce desk. However, just two years later, and this would lead to the infamous Black Saturday, where WWF owner Vince McMahon would buy the majority shares of Georgia Championship Wrestling in order to air his own programming. However, GCW fans were upset, and Vince really wasn't helping anything as he just wound up re-airing a lot of old WWF shows. All this resulted in the ratings tanking, infuriating that of Ted Turner. Turner, who was in the least hoping for some original content instead. And so, something of a coup was formed, as Ted Turner went to Ole Anderson, the last remaining shareholder who refused to sell his shares of GCW to Vince McMahon. Turner offered Ole's brand new promotion, Championship Wrestling from Georgia, a Saturday morning time slot at 7 a.m. And he would also give Bill Watts and Mid-South Wrestling a one-hour time slot on Sunday. This infuriated Vince McMahon, who was hoping to be the only wrestling show on TBS. And now, both McMahon and Turner were angry at each other and something had to be done. And so, Vince McMahon would throw in the towel, selling his time slot to Jim Crockett Promotions for $1 million in March of 1985. And just as soon as April 6th of that same year, Jim Crockett Promotions would air their first episode of World Championship Wrestling. And now, with Jim Crockett Jr. in the fray, things started to change rapidly, as the younger Crockett would merge his promotion with that of Championship Wrestling from Georgia, giving them two Saturday time slots. However, surprisingly coming out on the short end of the stick was WTBS's most watched show, which was Bill Watts's Mid-South Wrestling, which was cancelled as a result of this deal. And Mid-South, which would eventually change its name to the Universal Wrestling Federation, would just wind up being sold to Crockett in 1987. Then, following Turner Broadcasting's purchase of Jim Crockett Promotions in 1988, and World Championship Wrestling would go from being just the mere name of the show to being the name of a brand new promotion owned by Turner. Saturday night, 605 Eastern, turn to TBS. Now, as much as many Nitro fans don't want to admit this, real WCW fans know that WCW Saturday Night was the real show for World Championship Wrestling, as this was both the more established program and it was also the show that really helped to get WCW off the ground. 
In April of 1992, the show World Championship Wrestling would officially be renamed as WCW Saturday Night. The show was entirely repackaged, with a brand new home studio at Center Stage Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, although some matches would air from Columbus, Georgia as well. The show had an all-new neon aesthetic, as they were going for a very contemporary look. The original hosts of the program were Jim Ross and Jesse the Body Ventura, who were occasionally joined by Bruno San Martino as a special guest commentator. The next year, 1993, would see Jim Ross leaving for the WWF. He was replaced by Tony Schiavone, who would stay with the program until 1998. Likewise, Jesse Ventura was replaced by Bobby Heenan after signing on with the company the year after. But the brain didn't stay on for long, as the weasel was replaced by the American Dream Dusty Rhodes in 1995, with the son of a plumber affectionately referring to the show as The Mothership. Now, the reason why the American Dream referred to the Saturday program as such is because as hard as it might be for some modern fans to realize, Saturday programming at the time was the most important show. Well, today, we tend to think of Saturday wrestling as something of an afterthought, especially with shows like AEW Collision being a secondary or even a tertiary show, depending on who you ask. But let us remember that once upon a time, every worker was working for the weekend. Anyway, going back to the story. Dusty Rhodes would stick with the show until 1998. This is when Shivani was pulled so he could focus more on his other broadcasting responsibilities, and Dusty Rhodes would turn heel and become a manager for the New World Order. Just kidding, that never happened, we don't talk about that heel turn. In their place, Scott Hudson and Mike Tenay would host the show until Tenay was replaced by Larry Sabisco. And as for interviewing responsibilities, well, Tony Shivani and Mike Tenay did that as well, in addition to Lee Marshall and, of course, Mean Gene Okerlund. Now, as for the overall look of the show, that would change many times as well, since within two years, the set would be redesigned for a brand new futuristic look, featuring sliding doors and a fog machine. And then in 1996, WCW Saturday Night would switch locations yet again, this time to Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. This was the result of Turner's mobile production teams being preoccupied with the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. And we're not done yet, because WCW Saturday Night also did something else which was really unusual for the time, as this weekly program also went live. While WCW was mostly filmed way in advance, they did manage to go live a total of three different times. The first was when Hulk Hogan made his debut in-studio appearance. This segment featured the Hulkster and Sting being attacked by Sherry Martell, as well as the Stinger taking on Ric Flair, which was voted on by the WCW fans. This was followed by a second episode, which took place the following year on May 27, 1995, hailing from Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was to be an outdoor show, which was unfortunately caught in the Middle of some rain. Then the third live program, which also took place outdoors, happened on August 10th, 1996, and it took place at the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in Sturgis, South Dakota, occurring right before that year's Hog Wild pay per view, with this particular episode of the show functioning more like an episode of WCW Main Event, as it was used to lead in for Hog Wild, which was taking place on a Saturday night, unusual since WCW pay per views normally took place on Sundays. But alas, this would mark the beginning of the end, because as WCW WCW Nitro's popularity took over, it became the main show, and WCW Saturday Night had to take a back seat. And this was only exacerbated when Thunder came on the scene. And so, what was once WCW's flagship show, and the program that saw Ric Flair win a world championship, had now become, well, bottom of the barrel. As by now, they were lucky if they got upper mid-card talent performing in non-championship matches, because they mostly had recent graduates from the power plant, as well as being a recap show for the other programs in WCW's lineup. And then, April 1st, 2000 would be the last time that WCW Saturday Night held their traditional format, as the following week it became strictly a recap show. Yep, that's right, for once it's not Vince McMahon who's to blame for this one, as it was actually WCW itself and Monday Nitro that took down Saturday Night from within. And so, just three months later, on July 1st, 2000, it was moved from its 6.05 time slot and it was changed to WCW Saturday Morning. This led to the show's cancellation due to low viewership, with it airing one more time on August 19th, 2000. However, after the purchase by WWF, there were plans to try and bring back WCW Saturday Night programming, with possible show titles such as WCW Saturday Nitro, Hard on WCW, and Late Night Appetite, among many others. But the problem was, WCW by now earned a reputation for losing money, and no station wanted to pick up a program that was clearly damaged goods. This led to the quick and poorly done invasion angle and WWE instead opting for a brand split rather than bringing WCW back. 
And so, what was once WCW's flagship show, pioneering things that regular wrestling television never did before, such as going live or featuring world title wins, had now become a forgotten relic of the past. But while many younger fans today may not be too familiar with it, real heads remember a time when some of the very best professional wrestling out there happened from WCW on Saturday night. Thanks so much for watching this episode. If you liked it, please make sure that you give it a big thumbs up and that you're subscribed to the Thinking Fans channel. I want to thank all of my amazing Patreon supporters and I want to thank all of you for watching. And as always, Dave knows.